You know, I had talked before on here in previous videos about when I left AA, I went uh, through uh, CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and it was finding the right medications uh, that I got on. I'm on two of them. Uh, that's made a, a crucial difference in my life today when it comes to actually, you know, moving past uh, alcohol abuse. And uh, it's not going to, I'm not going to say it's solely those two things alone. I mean, part of, believe it or not, solving the drink problem for me was actually getting away from talking about drinking all day, every day. In fact, it was kind of interesting when I first left AA, the, uh, the idea that uh, my whole entire day didn't have to be focused around not drinking or whether I should drink or talking about drinking or thinking about drinking, uh, it was kind of a new and kind of a, almost a fearful place to be because I had been living in the cult religion for so long uh, that I didn't really kind of, it was almost like now that the cult religion's gone, now what? And uh, when I was able to, you know, start gradually building a life of my own back again and it wasn't uh, revolving around all the the cult garbage and the baggage that comes with it uh, staying away from alcohol or abusing alcohol or drinking you know staying away from it actually became relatively easy which is something i never thought i would actually say because i mean i had a you know a severe drinking problem while I was in AA, ironically enough, as a matter of fact, AA made my drinking 10 times worse. Uh, that, that'll that really offend a lot of Quackaholics Anonymous members for me to say that, but, you know, bottom line is that my experience, they're always talking about their experience, is just quite true. But I was, uh, for this video, I was actually thinking about, uh, well, it, what brought it to mind was something that happened uh, right before the weekend, is... Uh, uh, I have a particular manager that's pretty much impossible on everyone. It doesn't really bother me too much because uh, they're kind of an equal opportunity uh, dictator. Uh, they drive everyone all the time, uh, and they never pay anyone a compliment, and they expect, you know, they expect 150% out of you all the time, and so on. I'm sure everybody's got a boss like that or had a boss like that at one point or the other. But right before the weekend hit, um, Near the end of my shift, I was outside and I was smoking a cigarette. And then uh, he happened to step out there for a second. And normally he never says anything to any of the employees, me included. And uh, kind of casually, offhandedly, he comes up and says, you know, I know you come in a lot of the times early in the morning, uh, earlier than you're supposed to be here sometimes, you know. And uh, I know that a lot of the times you almost never get off when you're scheduled to be. You're always here way late into the evening. And I know you come in a lot of times when you're scheduled to be off. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, that's not going unnoticed. And in fact, it's actually appreciated. You might not always see that, but it's true. And of course, the first thought that ran through my mind when I heard that was, uh, I wonder what kind of workload he's about to pile on to me now. Uh, that's the first, you know, me being cynical and everything, I take everything with a grain of salt. But... I'd be a liar if I said it didn't kind of flatter me that the guy who never says anything nice to anyone actually said something complimentary in my direction. Uh, and uh, it ties into what I was going to talk about on this video and what I learned in CBT is because oftentimes in AA, if you, anything you do in your everyday or ordinary life or anything you do personally, uh, uh, AA people will often accuse you of saying you only do these things to feel better about yourself. Uh, for instance, if you help somebody when they're down, AA members will pop up out of the woodwork and they'll say you only did that because it made you feel good. And I remember when I was in uh, when I was in therapy, uh, and I don't remember exactly what the subject of the conversation was between me and the therapist. And I was lucky with him because he wasn't an AA member and he wasn't pro twelve step, uh, but he had. I said something, I, you know, there again, I can't remember the context of it, but I said, you know, probably I'm only doing that to feel good about myself. And, you know, therapist, I guess, you know, pop culture-wise, you know, I, I was thinking of a line from a film with Richard Gere where he's a psychiatrist, and he said, you just answer what everybody's saying with a question. And, of course, this was no, no exception. I mean, when I said I probably only do this to feel good about myself, he said, well, what's wrong with wanting to feel good about yourself? 
And I didn't have an answer for that. I mean, I had, it was so, uh, it had been so programmed into me and so brainwashed into me to believe that there was something terrible by doing anything remotely, I guess what you would call good, or I guess what you would call rewarding, uh, or anything like that, that there was this little voice in the back of my head all the time, part of the cult programming that would say, well, you only did that to make yourself feel better. And I had a, a really hard time answering him when he said that one simple question, what's wrong with wanting to make yourself feel better? And uh, when I couldn't answer it, he said, why don't you write that down and think about it for a week, you know? And I'm not, I don't remember if I really tried to think about it a week or not. I mean, but I, I did think about for a little bit enough to realize that I often drank uh, and I often abused alcohol because I didn't uh, feel good about myself. It's not just myself, but the, the situations that I was living in was, you know, really quite intolerable to me. But there was a part of me deep down that uh, really, I don't know what it was I had developed along the way or, you know, where it came from, but I really felt terrible about myself overall, you know. And the more I drank and the more I failed at things, the worse I felt about myself, you know. There was so many crushing disappointments in the fact that I couldn't successfully stop drinking. There was so many crushing disappointments in a lot of poor decisions I had made in life. And there was, you know, just uh, kind of a feeling of, you know, kind of a lousy feeling about myself in general. And oftentimes I drank to make those little nagging voices in my head go away. Now, of course, Quackaholics Anonymous members will say that's because you were an alcoholic. But in the case of Quackaholics Anonymous, the treatment is actually worse than the uh, affliction itself. Because if you're going to drink because you feel bad about yourself, I guess you could say, or if you have a very low and negative opinion of yourself, then it would stand to reason, at least from where I'm looking at it today, uh, part of, I guess you could say, the process of recovering uh, from a dependency on alcohol and drugs would be to actually develop uh, ways to feel good about yourself. It would only seem uh, kind of logical, I guess, from my perspective, that the better you would feel about yourself, and I'm, you know, I mean, we're using common sense here. I'm not talking about the narcissistic assholes like the ones in AA, but I'm talking about just in general as a person, you would want to kind of have a little bit of a better image of yourself than the, the constant uh, self-deprecation that, that I developed when I was abusing alcohol. Uh, and, I, and, you know, uh, AA, rather than try to actually cultivate that, uh, seems to cash in on it and build it and build upon that. They want you to deprecate yourself further. Uh, they want to erode your self-confidence. They want to erode your belief in yourself. They want to erode uh, the idea that you have in any inherent value as a person because you've become addicted to alcohol and drugs. And that it's almost like uh, it's almost like the culture itself overall. If you look through their literature, if you listen to the overall tone of the way people talk in meetings. It's almost like, the, you know, you've heard the saying a lot of the times, uh, you put yourself there as though that's some kind of an excuse or that's some kind of license uh, for other people to mistreat you and abuse you and stomp on you because you somehow put yourself there. It used to uh, annoy me really highly when I would hear people, you know, when they were dismissive of someone who was in pain or dismissive of someone who was in agony, they'd say, well, they put themselves there. So what does that say about you as a person uh, if because you see someone who put themselves into a dire situation that you're going to laugh and jeer and mock at them and, and go and kick them when they're down? What does that actually say about you? I mean, and it occurred to me that the people in AA that are oftentimes using that uh, to kind of kick you to kind of kick your self-esteem a little bit when they say, well, you only did this, that, and the other because you feel good about yourself. What exactly are they doing uh, in terms of accomplishing anything or anything positive? You know, it, uh, I'm sure anybody who's been in those meetings for a long period of time has heard about the meeting after the meeting. God, I went through, I felt obligated to go to that shit uh, for the longest. You know, they'd say, you know, if you really want to get sober, real sobriety happens after the meeting. There's always this 
uh, ever elusive real sobriety that they're talking about. But it, you know, I remember the first few times I was involved in one of those meetings after the meetings where they would sit around in whatever place they would go to and, and act like whatever. I don't even want to go into too much detail about that, but I was just thinking about the subject of their conversations in general, uh, the things they talked about, it was generally just beating down other people. You know, I mean, that was, you know, I remember another new guy that quit AA. He came in around the same time I did. And he said, you know, they, they, they say that we're supposed to hang out with AA people, but when we hang out with them, all they do is talk horrible about everyone. And, you know, I, I mean, I think it's kind of simple common sense that if you're around people and all they do is talk bad about the people who aren't present, then it's pretty much a safe bet to, to, uh, to place that when you're not around, they're talking shit about you. I mean, that was... It was kind of almost blatantly obvious to me that I'd see these people sit in these meetings and they would praise each other, you know, with their little false hypo hypocritical gestures and, you know, compliment each other. But then, you know, in these little gatherings after the meeting, they they would just talk horrible about, you know, different, uh, like, almost like there was this uh, battle of sponsors type situations. Like, if you know, this one old timer over here, he had his sponsees. And this one old timer over here, he had his spices, and both old timers secretly hated one another, even though they would pretend to admire one another in meetings. And you know, the spices of each one of those would just would just bash the other side. It was really very, it was really very juvenile, uh, you know. But it also seemed it came across to me as being very shallow. I mean. I don't know. I'm not saying I've never gossiped about anyone. I'm not saying that I've never talked bad about people. I mean, yeah, but. It seemed like if that's the sole topic of any conversation that you have is just bashing everybody else. I, I don't know. It just, it, it, it seemed very, very, well, it didn't seem very spiritual. <laughs> you know, you see them sitting in these meetings talking about how spiritual you are, but the subject of what they like to talk about is just very mean-spirited, very cruel, very bullying almost. And the point that I was making by that, by that observation is these are the same people that are the first ones in lines to tell you if you do something that makes you feel proud as a person and your accomplishment, you just did that so you could feel good about yourself. Well, what are, what are they doing exactly uh, when they're doing that to you? I mean, are they not beating you down because it makes them feel powerful? Are they not... Uh, running people down behind their backs because it gives them a smug sense of superiority? Are they not doing those things because that's about the only thing they've got in life to feel good about themselves? It just seems uh, bla it seems blaringly obvious to me now, but it wasn't obvious to me in, in, when I was trapped in the cult for the longest. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I don't think I really truly was able to see how deep the brainwashing goes to people who have been in it for a very long period of time until I was actually away from it for about a year or two. Uh, because believe it or not, that actually affected me on some level being told that all the time. You know, you only do this nice thing for this nice person because it makes you feel good. Uh, it never occurred to me to ask myself the very simple question the therapist asked me, which is what is so terrible about wanting to feel good about yourself? I mean, what is so terrible about having pride in your work? What's so terrible about having pride in a, in a goal you accomplish or something you set out to do and you, and you do it? I mean, part of the reward, I think, in anything you do, be it quitting drinking, be it working, be it some skill you want to learn or some athletic goal you want to strive for or some diet, whatever, part of the reward of that is accomplishing it. And part of that big reward behind all of that is it makes you feel good about yourself. And you know, it, it, it's funny, it's, it's like one of those things where the pieces all fall together after you've had a time to, to separate from it and objectively look at it. It's because the cult itself cannot have people who feel good about themselves. It, <clears throat> it cannot have people that have confidence in themselves because if you have confidence in yourself of any kind, or if you have faith in yourself, or if you say to yourself, you know, I, I want to try to accomplish this, I want to do this, I want to whatever, that goes against everything AA teaches you. AA teaches you that you are, you're pretty much useless without them. 
AA pretty much teaches you that, you know, to have any sense of, of self or any healthy sense of ego or any, any kind of pride and any kind of accomplishment you do is inherently an evil thing. They never tell you why it's an evil thing. If you corner them about it, they'll say it's because you're an alcoholic and you're incapable of doing anything elsewise. But <clears throat> I've never met anybody in AA that was making these judgmental pronouncements on everyone uh, that was actually uh, operating from a perspective of pure altruism, if such a thing even exists. I mean... I've never seen these old whiners that sit and judge people that look upon people who die when they're dying drunk and say, well, that's by the grace of God. Uh, I've never seen nobody turn that thing right around on them and say, well, you sit around here mean-spirited on your little high horses, uh, pronouncing judgment on all the newcomers and pronouncing judgment upon everybody that you deem less than you because guess what? It makes you feel good about yourself. I mean, the only thing you've got in life to feel good about yourself is your sobriety date and you mean-spirited, cruel bullying. <clears throat> I mean, what does that really say about you as a person? You know, if that's all you've got in life to look forward to in order to feel any kind of sense of accomplishment about yourself, I've got sobriety, you don't. <laughs> does that not sound like really... I mean, that, that to me, that's a very pet up, a petty, a very... a very shallow, a very mean-spirited type of existence that, you know... It's funny, they say, if you want what we have, and it's taken me time away from them, uh, a long time away from them, to realize that if, if they actually had anything at all with their, with their little steps and their, and their hypocritical society, I wouldn't want no part of it. You know, I wouldn't want nothing to do with it. I don't want what they have. And I don't think that uh, a large majority of people who are trapped in the, in the cult religion through fear or through the legal system or, or whatever it is, really want what they have either because it, it, it kind of amuses me that there's so many uh, AA old timers that talk about how wonderful it is and how many people it's saved, but all you got to do is hang around a home group for, uh, I'm going to say at least a year, and all you see is a constant influx and outflux of people coming and going, coming and going. So it must not, you know, there's really no attractiveness there that actually gets people to stay. It seems like the only people that actually hang on uh, for long periods of time are the people that have an ulterior motive behind what they do to NAA. I'm not uh, making a sweep it, sweeping blanket statement for everyone who's hung on for a long period of time because there's people I know of right now that were in, you know, the program, program, where they were in the cult for, you know, 20 years or they were in the cult religion for 15 years. I was in the cult religion over a decade uh, I think looking back on it now, you know, because I've had people ask me, well, if, you know, if the program's such a shitty program, how come you stayed for so long? It's, it's literally because you you become uh, snared into their little trap uh, to the point that you really don't see any alternatives or ways to get out of it. You know, it never occurred to me uh, that you could live a life free of alcohol without having to be constantly reminded of alcohol and, all, and constantly talking about it all the time. Uh, but I, I think a, a, a large majority of the reason why I hung on is because I do uh, know now in retrospect by looking back on it how much of my own confidence in myself was broken, how much uh, things in life that were important to me, you know, in, in terms of like I, I kind of always believed in the back of my mind with a lot of hard work and determination, you could pretty much accomplish anything. And I, I mean, within reason, I mean, come on. But I realized that, that over the period of time that I was in that cult religion, uh, they eroded a lot of that. They eroded that in, in sly, subtle, manipulative ways uh, to where they had me questioning my motives about everything, to where they had me looking at everything that I did, every little act as, as being some kind of selfish, ulterior motive, as, as being, uh, uh, what, is, what is that word they use? Self-seeking, which is actually really pathetically dumb. Uh, I'm going to do another topic video here pretty soon, but I think I pretty much covered the whole selfish bullshit in the last one. But it, it, it literally, it, I, I didn't realize until I had a lot of time away from deprogramming, or I guess you could call it deprogramming, or just getting away from it, or just not being surrounded by that level of, of pure negativity in, your, in my life day in and day out, and that pure brainwashing 
uh, cliched way of looking at the world before I realized how much they had they had broken uh, parts of myself that was actually important to me. Like they really did have me believing that it was that it was dangerous to be uh, to show any level of competency. They had me really believing that if I ever you know did anything uh, altruistic or helpful for someone, it was it was not for the right reasons. They had me questioning every little motive. Uh, to the point that I had, I was, I, I remember I was navigating through life very unsure of myself, uh, not even really sure, you know, it was almost like when I left, it was uh, a sense of really having to relearn who and what I am, not really in terms of the way they would have you do it, where you're just broken and submissive and, and bowing and, you know, prostrating yourself and self-deprecating yourself, but it, it took time before I realized that there's absolutely nothing wrong uh, with with having self-will, if as they called it. I don't even think that's an actual word. I think it's a made-up cult phrase, you know, or having determination, or even just having a he healthy sense of ego and a healthy sense of self. You know, I guess uh, to tie it all together here, as I'm about to, as I'm going to shut this off, uh, it's no secret that I'm not a that I'm not a fan of Christmas and I'm not a fan of the holidays. I mean, I'm just not. And it occurred to me that I don't really have any reason to explain that to people today. You know, when I was in AA, everything I said, everything I believed in was judged and examined and put under the microscope. I mean, I don't have to actually justify all my motives and I don't have to actually justify my existence to a bunch of asshole old timers today. I just personally don't like the holidays. I don't need to explain it. I don't need to, to, to look for approval from some fucking group of assholes to tell me what's wrong with me and what's not wrong with me uh, to just be who and what I am today. So since it is Christmas, though, I guess, uh, and it's supposedly, you know, gift giving and all that other good stuff, I guess I'm going to uh, title this video uh, The Gift of Self. And uh, it's one of the best gifts you can get when you leave the cult of Quackaholics Anonymous. So I hope that uh, all of you out there who are watching this and getting away from that evil, insidious cult uh, will one day be able to give yourself the gift of having yourself back without having to justify or apologize for your very existence. I guess that's about all. I... Uh, I actually have to work this afternoon on Christmas Eve, but I got Christmas Day off. But anyway, so this is a, a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, or, or whatever it is you're celebrating from Quackaholics Anonymous. Until next time.